What's going on, YouTube? This is JD Moonen. It's the second episode of Redneck Philosopher. The remake of it, anyways. Well, the restart of the podcast 2024. You know, I just want to start out with saying that if I uh, become emotional at any time during these podcasts, I hope you guys understand. I'm going to be telling my story about what it was like for me to have a relationship with somebody who had BPD. Uh, I'm going to talk about the experiences that I went through while I dealt with my own bipolar in that process. Um, and so some things might get very emotional for me. I've been through a lot and I've got a very deep, hard and sad story to tell all y'all. And I just, uh, I don't know, I woke up one morning and I felt like I was being told to tell my story. You know, I've been on Cura many times and I've seen all the pain and the anguish that a lot of people go through. And, you know, I didn't believe it for a, a time. And I was captivated as well, you know, by the trauma bond that comes from such a relationship. It's easy to tell ourselves that we don't have one or that we're not experiencing that trauma bond. But the truth of the matter is, is we are. And you are in a trauma bond more than likely if you are in a relationship with somebody who has such a disorder. For those of you guys who don't know anything about BPD, it stands for Borderline Personality Disorder. Borderline Personality Disorder stems from bad parenting. It comes from an abusive parent, but not an abuse in which myself, I would know, or say some others would know, which we know is physical abuse, either from a drunk parent or, you know, just a overly physical parent. It's not from sexual abuse either. Um, that brings a whole other different stem of problems. Now BPD, borderline personality disorder, it comes from a very specific type of abandonment and it's called I mean, a very specific type of abuse, and it's called abandonment. That abandonment is normally before the age of two is when it typically starts. Uh, if any of you guys would like to look at any more information outside of what I'm going to say in this podcast about this disorder and my experience of being in a relationship with somebody who's had it, a very good book that I read, it was called I Hate You, Don't Leave Me. That will give you insight onto what happens to somebody with this disorder and how hard it is to not only be with somebody who has a disorder, but also to watch them go through what they do. And it will make you also feel very bad and sad and often pity for the person who is suffering from that disorder. So where we're going to go on this story here is I'm going to start from the beginning. I'm going to start from day one. I'll give you a little bit of backstory before day one, actually, before of actually when I met this woman face to face for the first time. Now, I, got, I want you guys to keep, you know, keep an open mind here. And I also want everybody to know I'm not doing this for pity. I do not want your pity. I'm not doing this to make her look bad. And I'm not doing this for any kind of fame or anything like that. What I'm doing this for is to help other people who may be locked in this cycle and turmoil of a trauma bond. And I know that there are some people out there who are going to want to try to the bitter end just like I had. Because they're a hopeless romantic because they believe in love still. Uh, because the you know the world hasn't completely jaded them to the point of no return. I find myself on that on the cliff of that canyon a lot of times, wondering if I have taken the plunge into that cliff or not, and if I have become so jaded that I myself would rather be alone. Because I'm either too tired to deal with anybody else's bullshit or 
because just so much damage has been done to me. I don't know if I can actually do another relationship because of the ones I've had before it. I don't know what it is about people like myself who we love people. And a lot of times people will call this codependency. And I want to solemnly and wholesomely disagree. I do not need another person in my life. I haven't needed another person in my life for a very long time. I spent seven years of my life by myself. And I spent five of those years celibate. Not because I couldn't get any or because I had trouble talking to women. Oh, no. It's quite the contrary. As a DJ, I had no problems meeting a woman. Matter of fact, it's relatively easy when you are somebody who is talented on the decks. In a sense, some would say that women will throw themselves at you, especially if you do sorority parties or you're a headline DJ like I was. I was a pretty well-known name here in Austin and, you know, I'd made a substantial name for myself by running my company, Small Box Productions, for a number of years. So I didn't really have a big problem meeting women. Um, you know, I had, uh, we'll give you a little backstory here. Before I had, uh, I guess you could say, we'll start with my ex-wife. So I met my ex-wife when I was 19 years old. I got married. I'm sorry, I met my wife when I was 18 years old and I got married when I was 19. I was married to her for just about five years. And then I got divorced at the age of 24. Um, And that marriage, a lot of things had happened to me. Uh, My ex-wife had done some things to me sexually that would be considered abuse. And um, sometimes I do wonder if that has affected me into my adulthood Uh, with my being able to have children. So my ex-wife had tased me in the nuts one time when when I was laying in bed, um, and it took every ounce of me not to break her arm. Uh, And on top of that, the woman had cheated on me, and I found this out. You know, I'd grown suspicious at a certain point, and when I went looking, I found the emails and I found out that ultimately my ex-wife had been cheating on me. I didn't know how many times she cheated on me or how many men she cheated on me with. My, my guess is probably more than one. Um, during that relationship, her parents hated me up until the very, you know, up until right before the very end of our relationship because when her dad found out that most of what she had told them was a lie and that I actually was not this big piece of shit that she had claimed me to be, her dad actually looked at her in the face and told her that if she lost me, he, she would be one of the dumbest people ever. So, and that was because I, I did anything and everything I could for her. I doted on her. I loved that woman to death. Um, there was a time where I, I worked by myself and, you know, and, and took care of the bills and, you know, and I mean, it was just, it was, I mean, of course it was during our, you know, our first, you know, pretty bad recession in my lifetime during the Obama administration. And there was a point in my life where I, I just, I, I didn't, I lost my job and I had a, you know, I had a criminal background. It was already very difficult for me to get a job. So, you know, I had to, I do what I had to do and, and, um, you know, I sold extracurricular activities to, to make rent till one day I got, you know, I just, we got into it. I called my mom and mom had to come pick me up and I, you know, and I, and I really contemplated leaving my ex-wife that day. And the only reason why I went back was because she had overdosed, not really, she had just taken too much methamphetamine and, um, was sprawled out on the bed when I got there. And the woman had done so much methamphetamine that she actually stayed up for a week straight went into a psychosis, uh, of which, you know, a lot of people thought was funny, but I didn't, I didn't find it funny. I was woken up in the middle of the night by my grandmother when I brought her back to the house I live in now to sober up and get her off of drugs because of how bad she had gotten. And of course she blamed all that on me. Now I want to mind you, I, I didn't hardly do any of those drugs at the time. I, I literally smoked a little bit of pot and had a little bit of alcohol and that was it. Um, I'd come home one day from Marley Fest and, and simultaneously I walked in the door. She had punched me in the face three times and I grabbed her and I lifted her up over my, my body and I, 
held her up above me as I walked her through the house and threw her on the bed. And I said, if she ever hit me like that again, I was going to show her what it was like to be hit by a man. And I threw her on the bed and I left. That's when I left with my mom for three days. Um, and to my surprise, I brought her back here and she wanted to divorce me. Uh, because, of course, I was blamed for her drug problem. Because my ex-wife at the time did not want to admit that she was her own problem. So I fought with her mom. Mom came and was trying to yell at me in, in my face on my porch. And I told her if she didn't get off my porch that I would have the police remove her off my porch. And... That wasn't the only thing I dealt with many, many issues, you know, and, you know, that's, that's all, that's all under the, you know, water under the bridge, but it just goes to lead up to explain why I was, I have so many trust issues with people. That was the start of those trust issues. The first trust issue really comes about from my first relationship. My first real relationship was with a girl by the name of Kate Castillo. I was in high school and me and this girl were together for nearly two years. I love this girl to death. And I I was so madly in love with this girl. Uh, she was a girl I lost my virginity to and she was a virgin as well. It's one of those, uh, you know, one of those unique stories that you don't really hear much about anymore because most people don't have that. Most people don't get the the privilege of giving their virginity up to somebody they love who is also a virgin. I was one of the people that did. And me and this girl, you know, I mean, we, we talk from time to time, you know, but it has definitely waned over the years. But the reason why my trust issues had started with this girl was because her parents hated me. This seemed to be a, a common issue with, parents and me was they hated me and I guess it was because one for whatever reason women who come from wealthy families tend to have a liking to me I don't know why I don't know maybe it's because I'm a redneck and you know and I'm I've got that southern draw I guess maybe or maybe it's because I also show southern hospitality I tend to you know I'm the guy that holds doors open for you I call you yes ma'am no ma'am Tell you how beautiful you are and sweet and everything. I tell you that daily. I'm one of those guys. I'm a hopeless romantic, and when I fall, I fall hard. And so that's why I protect my heart now at all costs. Because I know that it will be taken advantage of. And so anyways, so the story goes on that my first experience with sex, her parents tried to file statutory rape on me. Well, it didn't stick because we were within the Romeo and Juliet clause in Texas, which essentially saved me from dealing with 15 years of my life in prison. So I had, uh, we were two years apart. I was 17 and she was 15. But in the state of Texas, 17 years old, you can be tried as an adult. Luckily, that Romeo and Juliet clause kept me from being tried as an adult. And the case never went anywhere. But the damage that ensued on both my psyche and my girlfriend's psyche at the time and what her parents had done to her just made me question altogether what the point was of having a relationship. And so my next relationship wouldn't happen until I was 19 years old because of that. Because the damage that was done to me was so great when I heard the story of what she went through whenever her parents took her to the police station and the cops made her tell them exactly what I had done or how I touched her or whatever. And this was a, this was a theme. This was something that I dealt with from a, from childhood. Uh, I was, I don't really talk about this much and God knows there's very few people that know about it, but I was, Sexually assaulted when I was 16 years old by a 40-year-old man. I never said anything because I was embarrassed. You know, I never, never was penetrated or anything like that, no. But I was pressured into allowing him to do oral things to me. And 
So you could say that my early life, my, my early life started out not in the greatest way when it comes to a sexual experience or, or an experience of a relationship. And so from the age of 17 to 19, I didn't even try to have a relationship. I thought that every person I would come in contact with would just do what either Kate's parents did to me or what a 40-year-old man had done to me. So I just avoided them altogether and went on about my life. And, you know, I, I got in the rave scene when I was young and, and uh, partied there for a long time because it was the only place that I felt I felt okay. I felt love. My dad, my biological father, uh, was nowhere to be found here in my life. And the times that I did see him, he was in and out of my life for most of it. Um, you know, I remember when I was living with, when I, when I ran away from home at 15, I was living with my sister. And at 16 years old, I saw my dad. And my, my biological father, when I saw him, he looked like he was so spun out on whatever amphetamine he was on, he couldn't stop putting his hand through his hair. You know, and was talking faster than a banshee. Then by the time... I was 17 at the time, and I did, I'm sorry, I take that back. I did have one, one other relationship, and it, it saddens me to, to this day because she is dead now. She overdosed on drugs a number of years ago when her late boyfriend died of a drug overdose. Her name was Emily Fentress, and I had, a, I had a rare and interesting connection with her, and I met her through my biological father. What was interesting about this was I was 17 years old, she was 15, and my biological father was dating her sister who was in her early 20s. You know, at this time, at 17 years old, I didn't see a problem with that, but now at 34, I do. So it's kind of interesting how double the years and then I see a problem with that. But however, her and I, we had sex one time, but I had a stipulation and I'd become very adamant on my stipulations because of the damage that I've already encountered prior. And I told her that if she was, because my father was doing heroin in the bathroom there, even though I asked him not to do that over at my friend's house where we were, where I was staying, my father and his girlfriend went in the bathroom, did heroin. And then when I asked Emily, I told her, I said, are you doing heroin with my dad? And she told me no, and I looked at her in her face, and I said, if you tell me now, I'll believe you, and I'll forgive you. But if you lie to me, we're done. So when Emily, my father, and my father's girlfriend, Emily's sister, when they all left to go back to Fort Worth, Emily called me later on, and she informed me that she had been doing heroin with my father. Me, having become callous and jaded already by the age of 17, I told her, well then, this was no way to start off a relationship, and so we can't be together. I said, because you've already started off the relationship lying to me. That was the first time we had met, and we'd been talking for a couple of months at that point. So then I, I went off for the rest of the next two years, and I didn't date anybody. I went off to sally up with a gang for a while and got into some legal trouble with them. Got my first charge. And I remember when we were standing in front of the magistrate, they were considering filing RICO charges on us. We had uh, gotten busted in, in, a, in an abandoned apartment that we were squatting in and uh, there was a bunch of stolen merchandise in there. I remember I woke up to a nine millimeter in my face and a woman cop kicking my shoe telling me to get up. I had a little dime bag of weed in my pocket, you know, some swag back then, some Mexican dirt weed and they took me to jail and this was my first time dealing with the case and I was, you know, distraught and I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to handle the situation, and um, nobody would bail me out. My mom, I didn't find out till later on, 
Ironically, my stepdad wanted to bail me out, but my mom wouldn't allow it. Because my mom didn't want me to turn out like my brother. So she wanted me to sit in there and she wanted me to think. So I did. And I remember I ended up wanting to get out so fast to take probation. That was probably one of the dumbest things I could have ever done. <sighs> so then that long fight ensued. Took probation, went to the first probation meeting, and then I said, I looked at my mom simultaneously in the face when I got back in the truck, and I said, I'm never coming to this bullshit again. She goes, yes, you are. I said, no, I'm not. Watch me. And I never showed up another day. So I got a war- bench worn out for me, and when, uh, you know, and basically I couldn't get a job. I found it very difficult for me to find a job. And so I just kind of hung out. I was hanging out with my friends, and, you know, I ended up, Going around, I was, you know, doing a lot of a lot of things to make money on the side with from extracurricular activities. Made a little name for myself in the rave community, and um, one day I decided to clean up. Yeah, I called my mom. I was nineteen. No, I was right. I was going to turn nineteen soon. I was like two or three months away from turning nineteen, and uh, I called my mom up. I told her I was ready to clean up, and I gave her my location. I remember I had a backpack full of drugs, and I threw it all in dumpster. There's a couple tens of thousands probably worth of drugs in there. People look at you, and they go, well, you know, you're crazy to throw that kind of money away or whatever. And it's like, no. No, I wasn't crazy because money is always just, it's just money. It's not that hard to come by. You know, this is America. It's the land of opportunity. You can make money any way you want. So long as you, if you're doing something illegal, so long as you don't get caught. Anyway, so then I found myself hanging out with my buddy Julian, and, and we went up to the mall, and, and I remember there was this just beautiful girl up there. This girl I was just, had my eye on. And what was funny was she was attracted to my friend first. He didn't want her. He didn't want anything to do with her. He saw how much I liked her, and he told me it was all mine. Little did I know that that was going to turn into the next five years of my life and that woman would end up being my wife. So her and I saw each other for a while and the first meeting that my parents got with my ex-wife was they woke up to us naked on the trampoline after we had spent all night <laughs> rolling on ecstasy and having sex on the, on the trampoline. What a hell of a sight it might have been, I guess, for those if, who don't know. My, my family is very Christian family. They were raising my brother's two kids, and so the kids opened up the back window to find me and my ex-wife on the on the trampoline, and uh, the only thing between us and them was a blanket. There was no uh, there was no clothes to be found. <laughs> um, pretty pretty awkward uh, first introduction of my ex-wife to my family. You know, and I'm not going to say all the years were bad because they weren't. I had a, I had a lot of fun with my ex-wife. We were together for a long time. I did, however, find it very ironic how a very close friend of mine and how my brother, they all had to tell me later on in my life, oh, you know, I just want, we never had, I never had sex with your girlfriend or your, your ex-wife. And the fact that you felt the need to tell me that after we'd already been divorced kind of made me start questioning anyways. That's beside the point. Anyways, Danny and I, we had we had a long... The first year or two was pretty good. It was pretty good. It was strong. We had a couple problems here and there. Uh, the biggest problem I had was I had a bench warrant, and so she, she stuck it out when I went to jail. She put the money out, kept money on my books, and so like that. And I guess maybe that's why... Maybe that's why I stuck by her for so long, even when I was unhappy. You know, it had gotten. I went through a lot of stuff with her. She had a she had a cyst problem on her ovaries and stuff, and you know. And I remember from when I was eight years old, my mom had one too, and and she had a, gotten a cyst on her ovary, and it, it flipped over, and she gotten gangrene inside. My mom did, and so I remember at eight years old, I come into my my grandmother's bedroom, and my mom was crawling on all fours trying to get to the bathroom because she was in so much pain. And that that image and that memory will forever be in my mind. It scared the hell out of me. 
So my ex-wife, little did I know that was life preparing me for the ex-wife that I was going to have. My ex-wife had a very similar problem. And she got the shot and all the stuff. She bled all the time. And it was just, uh, you know, it was a very taxing relationship from the get-go. I mean, my ex-wife, had always she got sick a lot. You know, um, and I just never could make her happy. She was one of those people that no matter what I did, it was never enough. And, you know, eventually that leads to resentment and eventually it led to strife and fighting. And the first fight was over drugs. She got physical with me and I left and then we came back and then to clean her up, I brought her back home out here to Cedar Park and to get her off drugs and I remember for seven days she stayed up straight and those seven days were one of the hardest seven days of my life at the time I had to watch the woman I love be in a deep psychosis seeing things that were not there other people found it funny I mean she would sit there and she'd talk on the phone to me and I'd have my hand up to my ear and my mouth like I was talking on the phone and I'd make a ring noise and I'd tell her hey baby it's me you know oh hey what's up I'm like, hey, so it's time to go to bed. You know, oh, okay. And then she go, okay, well, I'll talk to you later and hang up. And then start talking to somebody that wasn't even there. And this this went on for days. And then my grandmother woke me up one morning. And we have these four pillars out in front of my house. And she was out there with her back up against the pillars. And her hands made into what looked like a gun. You know, a little, little, little hand gun, you know, a little with her hands. And she was shooting at invisible people that weren't there. And when my grandmother walked out and asked her where I was, she goes, oh, I already killed him. So my grandmother came running into my bedroom, scared as hell. Finally, I was just passed out because I'd finally fallen asleep after having been up for a couple of days with her. No drugs, nothing. I was just stuck up with her, trying to make sure she wasn't doing something crazy. And then... Shortly after that, her mom was trying to get her to leave me. Her mom was, her mom's a very narcissistic woman in many ways. Arguably, you know, my ex, my ex wife has a lot of a lot of issues. Um, but her mother found that she met her match when she went up against me, really, because I didn't put up with no his bullshit, country boy man. I ain't gonna put up with no his crap. <clears throat> so one thing led to another, and they tried to get her to leave me, and. You know, and I kept the two dogs, and cop came up, tried to get me to give her one of the dogs, and I told him, I was like, no, she's leaving the family, not the other way around. He goes, well, that's your wife. I said, yeah, that is my wife, and she's leaving, and she can go by herself because her family's right here. Well, so then later on, we ended up, her parents, they had a townhouse, and, you know, we ended up working a deal out with her dad, you know, and it was really, really kind of, I kind of got shafted on that deal. I got in a real bad car wreck at the age of 24 and this was towards the end of our relationship and I ended up paying up the mortgage on the place for like it was like half a year or something like that and then I was I remember I was upstairs and I was doing laundry one day and then this was after my ex-wife was cheating on me you know and I'd kind of found out about it well then the divorce papers got written up because of course she was a coward and she didn't want to deal with what she'd done to me So she went home, she lied to her parents about me and all this and that, and her dad helped her write up divorce papers. And I'll never forget, I opened the front door, and my ex-wife walked up to me, and she put divorce papers and an eviction notice in my hand. And I, there was nothing I could do, but I hit my knees in that front yard, and I just started sobbing. That was... The first separation. Then after that, we um, we decided to get back together because her dad went over and talked to her. And when he found out who I was, when I called him up and I talked to him, well, so then we tried to get we tried to work it out. You know, a little. I didn't know she was pregnant at the time. And uh, I don't know. We tried to work it out, and it just it. You know, I, I went back and I was there for, I think, a couple of weeks. And, you know, and then, then the thing started happening again. She's just going home, coming home late, 
so one night I sat up late and I sat up, I was sitting there on the couch and I'll never forget this. It's like a movie. She come walking up the stairs. Her hair was all messed and she goes walking into the bedroom. And she was going to go lay down next to me with sex head from somebody else. Sex hair, you know. And I, I just, I told her, I said, what are you doing? And she was, I mean, I couldn't see her, but couldn't see her real well. I could see her silhouette, but I could tell she was ghost white because she got caught red-handed. I asked her where she'd been. She said, oh, I had to work late. I said, really? I said, uh, Randall's closed three hours ago. I said, you worked out late, huh? I had helped night soccer. I said, you take me for a fool. I used to work at H-E-B night stocking. I said, you didn't help the night stalkers. I said, you were gone fucking somebody else. And I said, you were going to go in there and lay down in my bed next to me. And I told her she's sleeping on the couch. The next day, I packed my stuff and I left. Of course, I felt bad about it, but that was my decision that time to leave. And my ex-wife made me hold to it. You know, but I wasn't ready for the pain I was going to go through. And I guess maybe this was my first experience with a trauma bond. I don't know. It's been so long now, I can't really remember. So after my ex-wife, I met, you know, I met this girl, Shana, who she ended up cheating on me with a 30-year-old man, you know, and so this was my second love interest cheating on me. Then after that, I uh, started DJing, you know. I started just following my dream. I wanted to do music, and I started DJing and started making a name for myself, running my own business. And I remember I met this girl, Kristen. Well, she lied to me about her age, and I didn't know this until about eight months after we had already been kind of seeing seeing each other kind of together. You know, she didn't want to put a label on things, and of course I was just like, oh, okay, you know, and I was just kind of let it be where it was, And I, but I ended up catching feelings. And so I really wanted to put a label on things, and so we we did kind of. And I remember when we met, she had, she was there with some girl, and uh, her and this girl it broke up. Um, and what was interesting about this was, uh, you know, the next thing I know, she gives me a call, and we were at the studio, and she comes over there, and the next thing I know, you know, we had sex in the bathroom or whatever, and then one thing led to another, and we just started seeing each other. I really liked her, and you know, I liked her personality. I she thought she was bubbly and a lot of fun. Well, when she went to Houston one day for a party, um, I didn't hear from her for like three days. And I knew what that was, you know. I've already dealt with this before. And I have no confirmation as to whether or not this girl cheated on me or not. But she, you know, when she hit me back up, I told her, I was like, where have you been? And she tried to tell me she had gotten date raped. And maybe she did. You know, now this was my shortcoming more than possibly. I don't know. Well, I told her, I was like, well, maybe if you would have kept your legs shut, you wouldn't have had that problem. And that was me just being scared because all this, the turmoil I'd been through prior. And that marked the beginning of the end of that relationship. <clears throat> So I had a long line of just bad experiences and relationships. And so it's no wonder that after that, you know, and then come to find out that Kristen, she was the only girl I'd been with for eight months. And, and then I ended up with herpes and well, I contacted her to tell her and she was like, oh, I didn't give it to you. I said, Kristen, you're the only girl I've been with for the last eight months. Yeah, you did. And so after that, I really never heard from her again. And that was pretty painful because I really liked that girl. liked her a lot. But I also recognized that we probably weren't going to be together forever. She moved on. She met somebody and they were happy. I think she got married or something like that. And I'm happy for them. You know, I had a couple flings and then finally I just got tired of it. Got tired of just, you know, meaningless sex or whatever and moved on with my life. And I just stopped having sex with people. I stopped seeing people after, you know, I'd met this girl. Actually, this, this is really what kind of made me stop seeing seeing anybody. 
I met this girl and uh, she was go go dancer. And I remember I just oh man, I just I thought she was the cutest thing in the world. And um well come to find out, you know, she had she was in this bad relationship and I was, you know, her and I were talking and, and my mom ends up going down there and helping her move out of that place and into a new apartment. Okay. And uh, we were already seeing each other, but she was still living with her ex and uh yeah, that of course should have been a red flag. But it wasn't for me, of course, me being the hopeless romantic that I am. And so, you know, we, my, my mom moved her out of there while I was at work because I couldn't get away. And, uh, well, then her, then her car breaks down. I get a phone call and I, and I go down there and, um, you know, I'm taking a look at her car. And, you know, I told her, I was like, look, it looks like compression's bad. I'm going to have to take this over to the shop. And I was, I'm a master mechanic, you know, I ended up taking over to the shop and found out the motor's blown. Pull that motor out, put another one in it. That one's blown pull that motor out, put another one in it, and that one's blown. Well, we're out of motors to get from the pick and pull. And so, you know, I finally told her, I was like, I was like, look, you know, I said, at this point now, I've done more labor putting new motors in this car than the car is worth. I understand you love this car or whatever, but we're going to have to, we're going to have to just box it and, and get rid of it. You know, I told her, I said, look, the junkyard, I'll pick it up for like 500. I'll give you 300, you know, and that'll be $800 you can put down as down payment on a car. She wanted a Jetta, so she goes, goes and gets this Jetta, and then after that, simultaneously after that, and she met my, my folks too one, one time, but after all that, never heard from her again. You know, and uh, I guess maybe that was because, you know, she didn't tell me she was a stripper too, and, and I mean, maybe I should have known, but she kind of like just conveniently left that out till the night she was meeting my folks. You know, it's just it, it's just that kind of, that kind of, you know, not, you know, just not, not being forthcoming about things like that. It just makes somebody ask questions. It makes you think that somebody is lying to you about other things. It really does. But so then that led to me spending the next seven years single and ultimately the next five years celibate. Well, then <clears throat> I was, I, you know, I, I had a little... I had a little kind of, I guess you could say like a little fling that was in that period of the five years. So I had like one little, one little incident that happened and, uh, there was this girl, I was, I was working for charter communications at the time and there was this girl, I, I really had my eye, I thought she was super cute. And, you know, I, I didn't know that she was actually seeing my team only monitor on this kind of ridiculous. And he was cheating on his girl with her and, and I didn't know this, I ended up finding this out later, but I had, you know, I've been trying to, you know, kind of talk to this girl and, and then we went out one night and she was like, oh, you know, blah, 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 you know, you wouldn't want me, whatever, whatever. And so the next thing I know, I get a phone call from her and we go out and, um, you know, I have a couple of drinks. Next thing I know, we go back to her place and, you know, had a wild night and I didn't leave until like six o'clock in the morning and then whenever the next time I heard from her, you know, I I'd, I'd told her I'd herpes before, I'd, and um, you know, it's it's always a hard conversation to have. She didn't have a problem with it at the time. I guess maybe she wasn't paying attention or something. And but then after we had sex, and it was you know she blew up on me, and I mean just went crazy. Well, that ended up throwing me into a, a, an extreme bipolar episode because right before that, I had lost my grandfather, and then one of my one of my closest friends had died. She was murdered, and uh, and I just. Lost it. Yeah, I snapped. And then that was when 2018 happened. That's when I found out I had bipolar. And then in 2019, so I, I, I ended up leaving my job because, it, you know, I didn't know at the time that, that they had to keep me on the payroll because uh, it was a medical condition. I was in an, in an, it was in and out of an outpatient program at the time, and I started learning how to really deal with this issue. I mean, we always knew I had a problem because, you know, I dealt with cycles my whole life, but but this particular issue, you know, I mean, this one was big. This was a, this was a major psychosis. I mean, I, I just, I knew in my mind, it was in my mind, I was like, I was, I thought this woman was going to marry me, you know, she was going to, she's pregnant my kid or whatever. And it was all, it was all, it was all 
psychosis. It was all just a figment of my imagination. It was actually happening. You know, and what was funny was like none of it, I didn't do anything, but I had $7,000 in the bank and, you know, I woke up a week later from the psychosis and all of my money was gone. And I can't tell you to this day what I did to spend it. And that was my first experience with a major, major episode, at least, you know, so I thought. <clears throat> well, then um, I was like, well, the hell with this. And I completely quit, you know, talking and seeing anybody, you know, and I just kind of like retreated into my bedroom into a hole because the destruction that I brought down not only affected me, but it affected everybody else in my life too. And so I just felt like it was best for me to sit in a room and the less people that I was in, in I interacted with meant the less people that would be damaged by my condition. So during this time, I, I probably experienced one of the biggest booms of my life. You know, um, in 2019, I had woke up one morning and I just had this idea. And I put it into action on on YouTube. And the next thing I know, I mean, literally overnight, my channel had blown up and I had, you know, gotten over 20, it was like 15,000 subscribers, I mean, within a month. And I mean, my channel views, I ended up having 33 million views by the end of the month. And that was the biggest boom of my life. I made $62,000 in one month. And, and, you know, I was like, here it is. Finally, I'm here. All the work, the eight years I put into YouTube had finally paid off. You know, I've made it. And then simultaneously, right after that, I go up, I go up and, you know, some things were said at a rally. And the next thing I know, I had the rug pulled out from underneath me and my partnership was removed and my only and main source of income was taken from me. So then I got in the stock market and, and in 2020, you know, I'd been on it, I'd been on a dating app and, you know, I was doing pretty well in stocks and, you know, I ended up turning, you know, that 60 grand, I ended up turning it into close to $150,000. My, my mom, my dad were impressed and, and, uh, my dad and had me invest 25,000 for him. Um, and then one morning I, I, I went way too far out in margin, um, against the, better judgment of a millionaire that I that had been helping me swing trading at the time. And that morning, Biden had said something one morning and uh, I got to watch as my account got margin called and I lost everything but about $20,000. And so that day I went and got my truck and I drove off to San Saba, Texas, and, and I contemplated killing myself, you know, because I just lost literally everything. And, you know, and then I didn't know how the hell I was going to tell my dad. I just lost his money. What was interesting was like there was this girl that I was kind of, you know, she kept coming in and out of, of this dating app. You know, I was on I was on uh, Facebook dating and she would match with me. We'd talk a little bit. And the next thing I know, she'd ghost me and I didn't hear from her. And then next thing I know, she'd be back, say a couple of things. And she ghost me again and didn't hear from her. And eventually I got upset because we had set up a date and I went out and in this date, we were going to go out to the Arboretum and, um, you know, I went and picked up a six pack and I was like really excited. Cause like, you know, we had matched a couple of times and, and, you know, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm understanding kind of guy, you know, I was like, Oh, you know, life happens or whatever. And so I go out to the Arboretum and I'm there and she doesn't show up. I called her phone a couple of times and just went straight to voicemail sent her text messages and didn't hear anything from her. And then at that point I realized, you know, I had just been ghosted. Um, and it was a really, sh really shitty way of ghosting me. Well, little, little did I know that that girl was going to end up being my, my next relationship for the next four years, just about in my life. So I, I ended up that night, I, had a couple of beers there. I, you know, I wasn't drunk or anything, but I was hauling ass on my way home. I was so mad. Remember, I got on the toll road, and I was probably going 40 miles, 50 miles over the speed limit. I was going like 120 miles an hour. It was like in the 70, something like that, you know. And I come rolling around the corner, and there is a freaking cop, man. Well, he lit me up, and 
I end up pulling over and he's like, you know, I pulled you. I'm like, yeah, you know, I told him, I was like, look, man, you know, I just had a really bad night, you know, uh, I have a license to carry, you know, firearm and stuff. And I just told him, I said, look, I, I was, I was supposed to go on this date and I got stood up, you know, and I know what I was doing was stupid and, and, you know, I'm sorry. Um, you know, just please take it easy on me. You know, I just had a really, really, really rough day. <clears throat> you know, that, that was just, it was really bad and it, it sucked. You know, because like literally right before that, I had a girl that we went out to a restaurant and we were sitting there talking, having a good time. I thought the date was going well. Next thing I know, you know, I ordered her lunch. She eats her lunch and she's like, hey, I got to go to the bathroom. I'm sitting there. 20 minutes goes by. I'm like, what the heck? So I call her, text her, no text back. And I call her and we went straight to voicemail. I was like, are you kidding me, dude? Yeah, this girl had just stood me up. Now, this wasn't the same girl, but it was a different girl. And this girl had just li- like literally came, got a free lunch, and stood me up and then left. And it's like, I was like, wow, dude. I was like, people do this kind of shit, you know? And and then eventually, you know, um, I was just, it's, it was so jading, you know? I was just like, wow, well, screw this. And so, you know, I was about to like delete my account. <clears throat> and then that girl that stood me up at the Arboretum, she matched with me again, and she completely didn't even remember who I was, you know. And now, of course, I didn't know about BPD at this time. I didn't. I didn't know she had BPD, and I didn't, had no idea what BPD does. Um, and she was like, "Oh, hey," and we started chit chatting, you know. And we had a really good connection, you know. I really liked this girl. I was like, "Wow," you know. I'd really like to meet this girl. Well, so then, you know. She was like, oh, hey, you know, Bob, you know, why don't you, why don't you hit me up, uh, you know, on the phone? And I was like, well, you might still have me blocked. And she was like, Ooh, you know, I didn't know what to do. And she realized that she did and uh, told her, you know, I was like, look, you, you know, you stood me up before. And so I was like, look, it's all water on the bridge. I'm not, I'm not mad. You know, I'm not mad about that. You know, it's whatever. <clears throat> you know, I was like, I know, I know things happen, you know, and, and, you know, I was like, you, if you're probably dealing with something and it's, it's all good. So she comes over that night, and I remember that my first day meeting her, my first night meeting her, um, she gets out of her car and just run and jumps up on me and just hugs me like a spider monkey. And when I saw her get out of that car, it was like I had – it's like my best friend had just gotten back from a trip. It's like I knew this girl from another life or something, you know, and I was just – Immediately, I was in love. I mean, right off the right off the get, and there was a chemistry unlike anything I'd ever felt before. I never felt this kind of chemistry, you know. Um, but it was also like I was young, like really young again, you know. And I felt that fire and that passion that I felt, you know, kind of similar to back when I was like when I first met my ex wife or. You know, back when I was in high school and I was met Kate, <clears throat> you know, and so these, these, that was like a passion that I just didn't think existed anymore. And I just fe- fell head over heels. You know, I remember we were just sitting there talking and just laughing and having a good time. We had a couple of drinks and I didn't realize what, what a lightweight she was. She ended up being like drunk off like three drinks or something. And I was like, whoa, you know, but I, you know, I'm a gentleman, you know, and, and, you know, I, I, never pushed anything or anything like that, you know, but I just, I just felt it was right. You know, it came and I had her sit in my lap or whatever. And we were just sitting out, sitting by the fire. And I remember I just, I just felt like it was right. I just looked at her and I was like, you know, you want to go inside? And, you know, she's like, I don't really normally do that, but you know, she felt it too. You know, it was just, the, it was just a really good chemistry. And I remember we go inside and we end up, we had this, some of the most wildest sex ever, you know? And then, she ended up having her period there and it was crazy, dude. Yeah. What a, what a like amazing train wreck, you know, as a first date is what kind of what it was. And, um, you know, and, and that just turned into what was a really awesome relationship. And, you know, I can't say that everything in the relationship was bad because the beginning of it was great. It was amazing. I was madly in love. Um, <clears throat> I hadn't ever met anybody that was so much like myself, you know, uh, but I also didn't know anything about mirroring at that time. Of course, 
then I kind of realized that like I had done that most of my life because I dealt with trauma, but I had, I also had extreme abandonment issues as well because my, my, my biological father, you know, um, so it made me question if I had BPD as well or something like that, you know, um, uh, interestingly enough, that book that I was telling you about, um, you know, I found out that people with ADHD, they said 80 is like 86% of people with ADHD will also be diagnosed with borderline personality disorder as well. Um, I thought that was very interesting considering like the entire, my entire generation has ADHD. So that's, I just thought it was weird how there's like this entire generation that I'm in could possibly have borderline personality disorder and none of us knew it, you know, but, um, one of the things I never really did deal with was my abandonment issues. Um, and I will say that at the end of this relationship that my abandonment issues aren't really they're not really there anymore. Uh, this relationship, you know, I, I often wonder if that's what this, this relationship was about, was about getting rid of that, that abandonment problem I had, you know, but, <clears throat> you know, I just, I, I remember when we first met, it was just like, it was, it was like a flame that I just hadn't felt in so long and it just, everything felt so right. It's so good. And I just couldn't wait for more. And it moved very fast, you know, like <clears throat> next thing I know, we were, you know, I went over to her house and I met her daughter who I just fell in love with. I mean, this little girl is, <laughs> what was crazy was her birthday was the same day as mine. That was so crazy to me. I, cause I, up until this point in my life, now mind you, I'm 30, I'm like 30 years old. And up until this point in my life, I had never to that day met one person who had the same birthday as me, you know, much less I'd, I'd only met like maybe one other, two other Libras in my entire life, but much less to meet a Libra who was my girlfriend's daughter and had the same birthday as me. You know, I've always been, you know, very spiritual and, and a mystic of sorts. And, and I took that as, you know, this was a sign from divinity that, you know, this was, this was it. This was the one, you know, and I'd been, and at this time I had waited years now, you know, I was, I was now like two years since I had even had sex, you know, of my own accord. I, and, and I was still in this, in the single thing, you know, for going on seven, eight years at this point. And <clears throat> I remember like, I just went over there and I mean, we just spent so much time together. I mean, COVID was going on. And so like, there was no place that was open. <clears throat> you know, you couldn't even go to the bar really. I mean, you could here in Texas, but it wasn't the same. And, you know, it was just, so we just, we were both homebodies and we spent a ton of time together, you know? And I mean, we just got to, it's like, it's like we got to know each other. And, like we had been together for like 10 years by the time, you know, three or four months rolled around. And, you know, but then we we started. I started noticing a couple of different things. You know, like she was. She asked me to stay, and and I did. You know, and I, and I told her I was like, look, you know, I just I want to be very clear. I don't need to stay here. Okay, I said I have my own place, and my stuff's paid for. You know, um, it's like yeah. As I told her, I said yeah. I know I stay with my grandmother, but that's because you know I just have a hard time trusting people after everything I've been through in my life, and so I just found it easier to just live with my grandma. Um, you know, I was like, but. I pay the taxes on her house and, and, uh, you know, and, and my rent there and everything is paid up for a year. You know, I took care of my grandmother's biggest bill and my grandmother took care of the utilities. You know, it was, a, it, it was, a, it was a good, it was, it worked out the way, the way that we had it done, you know, the way that we, that we did, you know, and, and, and I was like, you know, of course I was like this cool guy, you know, I had this badass truck. I had a, I had a 1985, you know, high Sierra short bed lowered by about an inch, inch and a half. And I had a 383 stroker in there as a, you know, badass motor glass packs. It was loud as hell. I could burn just about anything on the road, uh, except for Tesla. I'll never race one of those again, but you know, and so I was just, you know, she was just in love with me. I was just this, I was just this guy that, you know, I, I had, I had, you know, money and, and, and I was just in a good spot, you know, and, um, as time went on, you know, we got into a couple of tiffs here and there. And typically I'd been drinking and I didn't really know when to stop, you know, kind of thing. I would kind of like push subjects or whatever. Um, 
which has always been my thing. I'm, I'm kind of one of those people that's just like, you know, let's get this out in front of us and let's do it right now. You know, let's, let's deal with this problem. Let's deal with this issue and let's just do it right now. You know, and, uh, well, I mean, she's not that way. She needs time and, you know, come at it later or whatever. Well, <clears throat> you know, then, then things, you know, things started kind of happening, you know, I, I started noticing a couple of things, um, yeah, I was going to the store and I get food for us or whatever. Well, then I was I was getting all the groceries at, at one point, and at one point she like got real mad at me because she needed, you know, money for the internet bill or something, and um, you know, and and I was like I was like okay, well I've been paying for all the food or whatever, and she's like if you're not you know I can walk into her. She's like if you're not gonna help around here, then you need to go. And I was like whoa, I was like hold up. First off, let me be very clear. Okay, I was like. You asked me to stay here, not the other way around, and I've been nice enough to literally buy all the groceries for me, you, and your daughter, you know, since I've been here, and I've and I've been there for like a month or two months at this point or whatever, um, and that was like kind of our first little tiff, and, and then, you know, she was trying to kick me out one night when I'd been drinking. I'm like, dude, I'm not leaving, you know, um, I'll leave in the morning, and. I remember like I was on that I was on that that thing where it's like she would she would try and she would like say well, you know we're done or whatever and and you know I didn't understand that this was like a, a thing from BPD and I was just like look if we're done like I'm out okay and we're we're, we're done you know and and I, and I was at that point I was like I didn't really have a whole lot invested I was kind of you know whatever I you know I, was, I had feelings for her um you know I felt like I was kind of falling in love but you know, I mean, we were, we were kind of, kind of get into it a little bit and this is around like three or four months in. Well, so then, um, <clears throat> you know, then we, then next thing I know, one day I come home and she, she tells me that she loved me and, and I just was taken back. I, di- I didn't know if I was ready to say that yet, which I did. And I was just so afraid to say that, you know, because I just didn't know where this relationship was going to go. It was kind of early and, um, you know, and, and so, but I ended up saying it back and, and we were talking about having kids and then, and then there was a point where I really questioned the having kids part. And, um, I just didn't know if I was ready. Um, and she took that really badly, man. I remember that like really put a dent on our relationship and I didn't understand why I was just like, whoa, whoa. I was just trying to, you know, I was like, yes, I want to have children with you. But I was just like, I wanted, I wanted to make sure we were financially ready, you know, um, because something had happened and, and I remember I'm sitting at the house and the next thing I know there's this knock at the door. I go to answer the door and this woman hands me an envelope. She's like, hey, you know, is this man there or whatever? And I was like, no, um, no, she's not here right now. Uh, she'll be back in a little bit. She goes, okay, okay, uh, great. Well, would you would you give her this? And it you know, had her name written on it. I was like, yeah, sure, absolutely. So I go and I just put it on the counter. I didn't open it or anything. You know, it was sealed. And um, – <clears throat> When she came when she came home, I told her I was like, "Hey, baby, you know, there's a there's a letter over there. Somebody dropped by, you know. I was like, somebody dropped by, I give you this this thing." And she goes, "Oh, yeah, it's just this lone place, you know. That's that's just they 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 go to you know they go from you know they come knock on your door to, to collect payment." I was like, "Uh huh, you know." And I keep in mind, like I I'd had many loans at this point, you know. I, I knew that was bullshit. And um, so I came back out later on at night after we put Dolly to bed, and I looked at her and I said, "So." Are you gonna tell me what that what that letter really is? And she goes, oh, what, "What do you mean?" And I was like, "Are you gonna tell me what that letter really is?" I was like, do you, "I said, I mean, I'm not stupid, okay." I was like, "Loan companies don't come knock on your door trying to collect payment." I said that th- they were from the apartment. I said, "So what are you not telling me?" Well, then I found out she's behind on the rent. Um, now it wasn't just like a day or two behind. No, this was like a week or two weeks behind. But look, I, look, I've had an apartment before, and when you get behind on a, on an apartment like that, they charge you like fifty to a hundred dollars a day for each day you're late. And I knew there was no catching up on this, you know. I, I just knew it, and so I I'd already set things in motion, and and uh, you know I was I was like talking to her about let's let's just move back and let's move in over my over my family's place. You know, and we'll just save up the money to go get a place because we're already looking at other places, but we end up just not being able to get approved. And, um, it, you know, it, it was really devastating because we had found a place out in Georgetown we really wanted and we just could not get approved for it. So then we, we end up moving out over, we move in over here. And next thing I know, you know, my grandma and I are starting to have a lot of problems um, 
because my grandmother ends up getting really sick. And now this is when things start to really, really fall apart. Okay. And so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to end it there. And I just want to give you guys like the preamble and and kind of set up the story and, and kind of get you guys ready for the next episode, which is going to be the kind of the first chapter of me and Amanda and my relationship and my experience with BPD. I want to give you guys a little bit of a backstory of my history and my history with relationships and the abuse and the things I've been through so you guys could understand kind of my perception and where I am when it comes to relationships and where I was at at the time and why I was and why I am the way I am. You know, um, I will say this. I do believe that I'm a very good man and I will do anything for my woman. Um, that, what, I, what I've went through in this last relationship is a testament to that statement. You know, and I just want to be very, very, very clear. You know, obviously, I don't hate Amanda. I don't hate her. I love her. I do. You know, there's times where I'm, I'm very hurt and upset with her, and I don't know if I could ever forgive her without an apology. A lot of, a lot of apologies I've never gotten, and I've also been told, you know, in many cases that. She would just apologize to me to get me to shut up. You know, um, some say I'm an emotional man or whatever. And I, and I actually, I tend to think I'm actually like one of kind of the easiest boyfriends you could have because I'm very laid back. I, I'll let you do whatever you want. I don't really, I don't hold my thumb on you. I give you trust, you know, until you break it. Um, I don't question where you're at or you know, call and make sure you're you're doing what you said you're doing or go and check in on you or whatever, you know, or just show up randomly to whatever. You know, I don't do any of that. As a matter of fact, I even give you money to go out and do your thing. Because, you know, yeah, I, I know I don't I don't really like to go out much and so I'll I'll sit at home and I'm okay with that. I'm fine with chilling at the house, you know, and if you want to go out, your friends invite you out, I'm you know, go out. Have fun. You know? Um of course I never really got invited out, so I just never pushed the subject. But, you know, I mean, it is what it is. Um, and, I mean, I always paid for, you know, whatever she was doing and things like that. And so I, I think that the that the next the next episode, I think you guys might find very interesting in my relationship with BPD. I'm going to go into, you know, into some detail about a lot of things. And so I just want everybody to kind of be ready for that. It's going to be kind of a deep conversation. And I'm going to take you guys through my first set of hurt with, with that. It's going to be leading up to our first breakup. Um, and the, and the pain and the turmoil that I went through with that. It was very hard. Um, we have broken up more times than I can count. Uh, right now this is the third major breakup. Okay. Because I had to kind of realize that a lot of times when, when, a, when somebody BPD breaks up with you, they're not actually breaking up with you. Um, they're just, their emotions are overwhelming that they often make an impulsive and regretful decision. And that's what uh, had happened um, in many of the cases with, with my relationship with, with my ex or with Amanda or, you know, God only knows what she is to me right now. So anyways, um, if you guys like the podcast, please don't forget to like and subscribe. Uh, we'll be posting more of these. Um, you know, and, and these are really deep subjects for me. These are things that I, I haven't, very few people know my story. And now I'm, I'm coming out and I'm giving it to the world as to what I've been through, not only in my life, but in my relationships. And, I, and I'm not doing this, like I said again before, I'm not doing this for pity. I'm not doing this because I want, you know, I want people to give me money and tell me, tell me how sorry they are for me. No, that's not what I'm doing. I'm doing this because... I want other people to know the experience I've went through and know that you're not alone because it always helped me to know that I wasn't alone. And it, and it gave me solace to know that there was other people I could talk to about the hardships I was going through, about the abuse I've been through in my life, okay, and about the, the, the gift and or mental illness, as other people call it, that I have. 
and I just wanted to use my platform that I have. I've got a I've got a pretty pretty decent sized platform, and I've got a, an audience and a reach that other people don't, and I wanted to utilize that in hopes to help people who are going through a similar situation, or in hopes to, you know, if I can help one person out of a hundred or even a thousand, then my job is done. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to get off of this episode and I'll see you guys on the next episode. I hope you guys enjoy this content. And don't forget, like I said, like and subscribe. And if you do like my content, go ahead and please share these, share these episodes and let other people know, you know, Hey, there's this guy talking about, you know, some, some very serious, you know, relationship stuff that, that I, that, you know, other people don't talk about. I think other people are afraid to talk about it. A lot of people don't want to want to go out there and put their business out there. Well, I'm one of those people. I've been in the limelight for a long time, okay? And I don't really care if people know my business, okay? Because it doesn't change me as a person. A person and nothing I've done. I'm, I'm not ashamed of any of it, okay? And given given the, the opportunity again, I would be with Amanda again because I learned a lot from this relationship. And truth be told. It's better to have loved and have lost than it is to have loved than it is to have never loved. And that, that's I know that's that's cliche, but it's so true. Because there were times during this relationship that I will never forget. There was a love that I had and that I experienced with this woman that I've never had or experienced with anybody else. And those are things to be cherished. Even if there was abuse in the relationship. And you can martyr yourself if you want. But that doesn't do anybody any good. You know, you can play the victim if you want. But at the end of the day, you chose to stay. You knew the damage that was being done and you knew it. But you were addicted to it. Just in the same way I was. You know, there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a really interesting feeling to be said for feeling like you're needed by somebody else. And I often say that a relationship with somebody with BPD is a very interesting relationship because you have to look at this when – you, when, you, when you take back and you look at it from a perception without your biases applied to it, you'll realize that the relationship you have with this person, the reason why it's so hard to turn away – now given there was, there was an actual child involved in mine, but with somebody with BPD, it's like they're your lover – and your child at the same time. And I don't mean this in some weird, you know, pedophilia kind of way. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about that you take the role <clears throat> for this grown person, you take the role of the lover, but also the role of the parent in many senses. And it's it it so it, it it's like it activates your primal instinct. And it's a different kind of love that comes out. And that's why I often think that you know, when we talk about trauma bonds, I think that, you know, they're, they're used in this codependency type, whatever, and people, you know, they're, they're demonized. And it, I'm going to be honest with you that the, the kind of love that I felt, I wasn't codependent on that love. I didn't need that love. I loved that person. And I didn't want to be away from that person. I mean, that's that's what love feels like. Love is you don't want to be away from them. You want to be with them all the time. That's love. That's not odd. It's not weird to have that experience. And so don't let anybody tell you. If you love somebody unconditionally, for one, don't let anyone jade you. And two, don't let anybody tell you it's codependency. Codependency is this nasty codependency in my opinion doesn't even exist i'm going to be honest that's some term for somebody to essentially justify narcissistic actions it, it justifies you leaving somebody in the dirt and doing to them doing to somebody who has BPD or narcissism or whatever, and it justifies you doing the same thing to them that they just did to you. That's all this idea of codependency does. It's, it's a defensive talking point from the ego. 
and I just can't get on with that. You know, um, now do I think it's some kind of addiction? Yeah, absolutely. I think there is a, there is a, an addiction that, that is brought onto somebody by trauma and reward. That's not codependency. That's addiction, period. It's the same thing a drug user gets. It's the same thing that a, somebody who's addicted to video games or sex. It's the same thing, dude. It's not this idea that this person is codependent. It's just that's all talking bullshit. That's some psychiatrist crap. And all it does is anybody you say to them that they're codependent or whatever, all you're doing is belittling that person. No, that person is in love. I've watched my family do things for people and those people turn around and spit it in their face and my family still does for them. You know why? Because that's the morals that they grew up with. That is the morals of Christianity, really. Do unto thy enemy as you would your neighbor is what Christ taught out of the Bible. You know, and I will say this, if the world worked that way, it would be a much better place. And there are still some of us who do do good deeds like that just because we believe everybody deserves a chance and we believe that everyone can change. And then there's people like me who I just love everybody. So anyways, that's it for the second episode of Redneck Philosopher. Um, I hope you guys liked the, the preamble to what's coming, episode three, and I will see you guys in the next episode. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you know anybody that might like this content or that might, you know, gain, gain something from the content that I put in this audio. Please send it to them. And uh, if anybody would have any questions, please just, just uh, you know, tag me in the comments and I'll do my best to, to make sure to to talk to any everybody I can. Once again, thanks for listening. Love you all and have a good day.